Good morning. Welcome to another session of hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development in Education Online. And uh, today we have the fantastic Hannah Wilson who will be looking at flexible working in the new normal. So that session is the one that we're focusing on today. And just a reminder, later on this week, uh, tomorrow, we've got Daniel Connor and we have Joe Miles from two outstanding schools within the Chiltern Learning Trust who will be discussing educational excellence. And on Thursday, we have Amjad Ali of BAME Ed who will be looking at how do we recruit a diverse team. And then we round the week off with Joe Richardson who will be looking at school improvement and pulling out the nuggets, the golden nuggets of the priorities that we should be looking at when we move forward into the next year and beyond. So that's what we've got coming up with for you this, uh, this week. So without further ado, I'd like to start Hannah's session on flexible working in our new normal. Good morning everyone, I'm Hannah Wilson. I tweet and blog as Ethical Leader. I'm a former head teacher and the co-founder of Women Ed. And I'm currently doing my MA looking at flexible working. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking you through some of my initial research and reading. So the context. Um, flexible working or the lack of um, has been a barrier for the progression and recruitment and retention of a lot of people in the education sector for many years. But there's been a lack of choice for people to be able to actually choose to work flexibly and people have been told no, that's not possible. But as we went into lockdown for COVID, everyone's been forced to work flexibly. I know that this might be a poor proxy in some ways, but it has shown that it can be done. It has shown that practices can be changed. So the business case against flexible working kind of got dismantled and imploded overnight. The irony of our profession is that we serve everyone else's children at the expense of our own. In the Women Ed book, 10% Braver, uh, Helena Marsh and um, her, co her colleague wrote the chapter on flexible working. Um, and they address this kind of irony, the fact that People have a misconception about being teachers and that we all work nine till three. And it's actually a really easy job to have and look after children. And I think actually lockdown has raised the profile of how hard teachers work. And there's more appreciation now from society. And a lot of people who are now homeschooling their own children appreciate how hard teachers actually work. The data um, speaks volumes. We know we are a female heavy profession, but we know that our leadership models are male heavy. When it comes down to things like negotiation and the pay gap, which is one of the kind of the fallouts of flexible working, um, women are less likely to negotiate salary, men are more likely to. And we also have a, a high attrition rate and we are losing a lot of women predominantly um, every year of a particular demographic, women in their 30s, women who want to have families, women who want to return from um, mat leave or parental care leave and work flexibly and they're told no or they're told that if they want to come back they have to be full-time or they have to work part-time and relinquish their TLRs. So we are losing a lot of staff as a consequence of not working flexibly. The DV has been doing some work, some strategies and policy in this area now for a few years. So in 2017, they published their initial guidance. And in 2019, they did an interim review. Um, they got an independent researcher to come in and see what the early impact of the guidance was. So I do recommend that you get this document. HR looks at it, SLT looks at it, and you consider the implications of it for your context. It's some interesting initial um, data around job arrangements and part-time teachers. Predominantly we have more flexible working in primary schools than we do secondary schools and I'm sure those of you who are from secondary schools listening will probably think that that's due to timetabling and, and class contact. In a primary school perhaps a job share arrangement is easier, you can carve up the week um, in a different way. However we need to make sure there's some equity across the sectors um, and that secondary school teachers can have those part-time job share arrangements like our primary colleagues can too. I'll let you read this one about best practice. So this is the statement of intent, the vision from the DfE about why, as a profession, we should be flexing um, the workforce um, and creating diverse opportunities. So, as I say, I am in the middle of my master's and I'm looking at flexible working and doing my master's in the middle of COVID has been interesting because obviously my lens has changed quite a lot. And for my initial kind of reflections and reading, these are the kind of key questions I'm looking at. I'm breaking down flexible working into the different stages of the talent management process. So flexible working when it comes to recruitment, 
flexible working when it comes to retention, flexible working when it comes to re-engagement of those qualified teachers who are in the country but not working in our schools. And then thinking about the kind of the changes in practice and policy and perspective we need in our system. And then finally, the kind of the impact on culture and ethos and what we need to do to enable flexible working. Because it's one thing letting someone work flexibly, but does our school's culture and ethos actually enable that and empower that? Or do we then have subsequent um, barriers and obstacles that are going to make it quite difficult for that flexible worker to thrive and to flourish? So some of the um, models here are things I'm putting together with my kind of thinking. So thinking about the Simon Sinek Golden Circle model, the why, the how, the what, that is how I've kind of um, approached this idea of flexible working. What is our driver and what are the outcomes of this going to be? So I'm thinking quite a lot about um, how we manage um, our staff in schools and the kind of the split divide between those who teach, those who lead and those who are non-teaching. Also thinking about where the visible role models are in our organisations and in the system. Thinking about the kind of the vision to the provision or the putting the policy into practice. And then considering the kind of the different the different strategies, the different strands within our organisations that we will need to tackle. Some of those things that are conscious and unconscious, some of those things that are visible and invisible. And timetabling will come up as well, because we know that actually flexible working can only happen if the timetabler or the timetabling um, embraces this and makes this a possibility. So there's lots of definitions out there and I think it's important to be clear about what we're saying flexible working is and what it isn't because flexible working in a non-school environment obviously can be truly flexible but we know that there are things that will handcuff us about um, student-teacher contact ratio um, and the kind of the constraints of working in a school. When you google flexible working flexi time also comes up as a bit of an Americanism. Um, so this is the kind of the generic definition but I'm, I'm working on what it actually means for us in schools. We think flexible working, there are different categories to it. And I think this is important as well, because we might have like one type, one model, one category of flexible working in our context, which then might misrepresent the kind of the wider piece. So the different types of flexible working present in schools, the ability to work part time, whether that means whole days or um, half days or a different kind of working pattern across the week where you're not uh, a full time contract. So you might be on a point eight or a point six or point seven five. Then thinking about job sharing, where you have coverage for a class, for example, in primary, um, but you have two people sharing that job. So there's this interesting data about which companies, which organisations enable part time working versus job sharing. And I actually think from a timetabling point of view, a job share agreement might be easier for a school to get their head around because you have one person with two faces across the week. But it's up to them to make this working agreement um, possible. And it's up to them to kind of make the communication and the handover really, really smooth. Then we have um, compressed hours, which I have seen work really well um, in a couple of schools I've worked at where um, you might work slightly longer days or you might do um, four days, but be in five days. So it's thinking about the kind of the top and tail of the day, particularly if you're a parent or a carer, you want to drop off or pick up kids. Um, it, not every day, but even just some days. So it's thinking about the kind of the actual hours you're in the building. And then staggered hours is a kind of another variation of that. So I know I've worked in some schools where um, you might have a teacher who's not a tutor, for example. So they can start work at nine o'clock rather than um, 8.30. Um, I've also worked in schools, well, a school I was a head teacher of, where we had a four and a half day working week. So the school actually finished at um, lunchtime on a Friday. Um, and then it's remote working, which I think until lockdown, lots of people have probably poo-pooed and said it's not possible um, in education. And it's been really interesting to watch the change in rhetoric and the change in narrative over the last few months. I know that remote working wouldn't be ideal in a school tech context, but there are going to be those people in those situations in the future where perhaps now we know that remote working could work. It's not ideal to be teaching from home via a screen, but if someone broke their leg, for example, and couldn't get in, there are now ways that we could use technology to enable that to happen. I've also worked in schools where um, you have teachers who do their TLRs at home. So they might be on a point A contract, but all their teaching is in the th first three days of the week. And then they have one day they do from home. And that day is the kind of the flexible bit flexible bit of their remit so this is just me kind of like thinking out loud all the different components and language um, and search words that I'm using when I'm doing my literature review for my research because depending on what profession you're looking at depending on what country or culture you're looking through and um, there's different kind of lingo so this is just me sort of like brainstorming the different ways of approaching what flexible working in the schools 
um, might look like. So my working definition, and this is, as I say, a work in progress about how employers and employees can interpret and understand what flexible working is. And it's really being clear about all those different strands in purple there about the different types of flexible working and flexible teaching. If we're going to be clear, um, we're talking about teachers here. So it's how we can combine our kind of our mindset, I guess, around the kind of the core time, the time we need someone to be in the classroom, and then the non-core time, which is the kind of the, the duties and the responsibilities and the PPA and the planning time, but does that need to be in the building? Is there an opportunity to work off site and to do things at home? I know some schools enable people to go off site to do their planning or their marking, for example, or to have certain hours that they can do from home, um, but they're still seen as being um, a full time worker. So I think one of the key messages here is that flexible working, flexible teaching is about flexible thinking as well. And we need to reframe how we see flexible working and we need to see the kind of the possibilities and the opportunities of it rather than the inhibitors and the obstacles and the barriers of flexible working. So trying to make sense of the kind of the, the process. And again, this is a work in progress. It might not all be in the right order because each person I show this to gives me some challenge on what goes in what order. Um, I've just been thinking through the kind of the flow of the different things we need to process in order to enable um, and embrace flexible working from the law through to our rights and our, our unions through to kind of HR processes in a trust or in an LEA or in a, in a school. Thinking about how the policies are then written to enable that to happen and to protect the rights of the school, but also the rights of the individual teacher. The issue of governance is really, really important. So the kind of the vision and the commitment from um, the, the school leaders do we have flexible governors, for example, or governors who work in environments where they've seen flexible working work? How can they share that expertise? Um, what is the mindset of the leadership team in particular? How the culture and ethos of the school enables this? A big one that comes up is communication and how when schools embrace flexible workers, they then need to consider how they communicate to staff. And that little and often that drip feed approach of briefing and newsletters and flip meetings um, needs to be taken into consideration as well, because otherwise you have um, disempowered part-time workers who don't know what's going on because the information flow um, isn't enabling that. Then thinking about the kind of the structures and the systems, so that could include the timetable, the duties, the way lessons are allocated, for example. Another thing that comes up as a barrier for flexible working is then expectations around training and development and inset days. Um, and how we need to then have flexible CPD approaches to enable flexible workers. I've talked about the timetable already. There is a cost implication that's something to consider um, because sometimes if you have like 2.6 workers rather than one full-time worker, there might be a variation there um, in staff costs. The impact of all of this on recruitment and retention and how we need to have a, a different mindset, a deficit mindset about this is unhelpful because actually um, it costs schools money when we lose staff and we have to re-advertise. So can we reallocate that money as, as a different way of working with staff in a flexible way? And then considering those role models at every tier in the organisation, that staff can look up and see those role models who are enabling and modelling um, the working practices being flexible. And that goes for men and women. There's research that shows that organisations who have male colleagues who work part time or work flexibly create a wider culture of acceptance when it comes to flexible working. So some of the lines of inquiry that are emerging from the initial reading, initial research, is this distinction that is flexible working more common in primary than secondary? If so, why? Is flexible working more common in leadership than in um, non-leadership roles? Interesting one to think about there, probably to do with the fact that there's less um, student um, contact required. Flexible working is more common in women um, than in men. Flexible working is more common in parents than in non-parents. I've worked with colleagues who want to work flexibly for a range of different reasons. So we need to be careful here not to consider that flexible working is a, is a case put forward by women or women with children. Flexible working being used as a retention tool and a recruitment tool. I think at the moment it's quite reactive and people are kept through flexible working. But how could we recruit differently into the sector by working flexibly? And thinking about this distinction between the difference um, of working part time and working a job share. 
um, and how that might enable or disable um, flexible working practices in schools as well. So these are just my initial kind of lines of inquiry, my hunches about the conversations and the reading um, I am processing. So if you think about recruitment, first of all, the pledge to flexible working in the system, I think really needs to start at ITTE. And I've been talking to people for a few years now about the fact that we need to have more flexible training models. And it's been really positive to see a couple of organisations now, a couple of higher um, education institutions and some of the big training providers are doing a part time two year training model, particularly for career changes. Um, this makes things much more viable um, or people who have already got children and are thinking about coming into the profession, because asking someone to commit to training full time when they want to work part time in the future might prohibit them from coming into profession in the first place. So if you have got a schools direct program or you host um, trainees, I think considering how we can be flexible from the get go and establish flexible working practices in the profession is a good starting point. Then thinking about how we recruit into our schools and how we advertise and the kind of the messaging. Do we mention flexible working in our adverts? That's research that shows that those schools who mention that flexible working applications will be considered means that you get a more diverse and a larger talent pool. So it's a bit of a no-brainer, really. Not all roles will be able to be done in a flexible way. I, I do understand that. But just by sort of like setting out the intention as an organisation that you will consider it, you will get different people considering to apply. How we then recruit into management people with TLRs, middle leadership, senior leadership needs to be considered. So I, I worked in a school where I organised a co-head of the English role. I had two brilliant um, key stage managers. They were both very, very capable. Head of English is a massive role in schools. And we negotiated with them that they would step up and co-lead. And I think having co-leadership um, opportunities in the middle leadership tier then takes away some of the stigma, perhaps, from the senior leadership, particularly at headship level. And I hadn't really thought about the governance piece until a few weeks ago when I spoke to somebody who is a MAP governance lead who was saying that the flexible working arrangements we're currently experiencing during lockdown has really enabled governance to thrive and that some people who struggle to be governors because of the time commitments, the volunteer commitments, the travel, the, the amount of time it takes to process all the papers before, before a meeting, it means that some governors have very little contact time um, actually in the school. And by flipping the governance model and doing it remotely, Governors now have more time and more energy to do more meaningful work. So I think that's something to consider as well about things that we can hold on to moving forward. I worked in a map where we were quite geographically dispersed and we did use Google Hangouts um, for meetings. And it, and, it, and it is weird having a governance meeting where not everyone's in the room and you've got a laptop you're talking to. But it does mean that you've got those more flexible arrangements to include everyone. And it does then mean that you have a more diverse set of people around you. A lot of leadership team meetings have been doing the same recently, where people rush home from their day at work to then log in and join the SLT meeting. I think we need to like reshape our thinking of do we need to be in the room? Do we need to be in the building to have maximum impact? Time-wise, um, publish a report um, every year about um, the data when it comes to flexible working. And it literally came out, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, the most recent data set from 2019. And it's interesting looking at the, the trends since the last data collection. So there is a call for more employers to offer flexible working um, in job ads. But is it happening? It's interesting that only 15% of UK jobs offer, offer any kind of flexibility. And this hasn't shown a massive incremental increase from the um, a data set five years ago. So the link here to the Flexible Jobs Index for you to have a look at. But I just thought that was quite interesting that flexible working for me has definitely become a term, a word I'm hearing, I'm reading, I'm seeing a lot more. So is there a misconception or misrepresentation that we are leaning into it more than we are? And is it saying we should be embracing and leaning into, into more? And do we need to accelerate these kind of opportunities for flexible working, particularly when we're talking about the kind of the recruitment and the retention crisis that we're experiencing in the profession right now? So there's some interesting just graphics here um, to capture the data. So this shows the five year trend for the proportion of adverts that mention flexible working. So as you can see, just under a 6% increase in the last five years, which to me doesn't doesn't sound like a, a very kind of like expansive commitment to different working practices. Interesting one here about the correlation between those adverts for flexible working compared to the salaries the, advert, uh, the adverts are for. Um, and you can see a trend here that um, in that very bottom one there, there is an increase in people of a higher level 
salary level, um, having opportunities to work flexibly. And I think that's something to consider that are we creating a, a glass ceiling in the system that you need to progress higher up the ladder in order to work flexibly? Um, and then depending on where you are in the leadership structure, are we creating the double standard for those the, those who teach and those who lead? So I think messages like that are, are really, really unhelpful. I, I know that one of the tensions that I explored as a head teacher with my team was that those who were non-teachers could work really flexibly, and whereas those who taught couldn't. And I know that's there's lots of arguments we can say as to why that is. But when we're thinking about a united team and a shared vision of values and culture and ethos for a whole organisation, and when we're talking about e equality between um, all of our employees, it is something to consider that we've got these these tensions, these dynamics between different groups of people um, in the building. Equally, contracts is an interesting one. So the types of flexibility offered by job advert by contract type, flexible working contracts, 27%. Interesting piece there, 60% home working, part time, 44%, whereas job shares, 4%. So just some interesting sort of numbers to process here and what it means in our context within the school system. Timewise, our working in partnership would now teach the organisation that enables um, career changes to come into teaching, particularly, I think, in the in the STEM subject. So how that data translates to our profession is interesting. Tez says that only 6.6% of secondary teaching jobs are advertised as part time compared to, I think, it's 17% for primary. Thinking about, again, our messaging, our recruitment models, where we're advertising, how we're advertising, what we're saying to our potential talent pool is really, really important um, and I in those bigger departments in a secondary school it is absolutely possible to to enable part-time um, workers so some more data here around um, the time wise and now teach um, research into current practice so we are 10 percent under the national rate for part-time workers and considering we are female dominated that's something to consider when nationally 42 percent um, of women work part-time interesting one about head teachers only three percent have a flexible contract I'm seeing more of co-leadership models come up and there is now a new website being built, which is a talent partnership matching service from the shared headship network for people to find um, someone to apply for a co-headship model with, which is interesting. And I think one of the things that doesn't get captured is quite often the informal arrangements. So this data will be based on the formal working arrangements and agreements um, that is contractual. But there are those kind of like those informal agreements about flexibility, which perhaps we need to formalise and we need to capture so that it's then reported and we can see the true kind of extent of flexible working in schools. The data, that last statement, I think is quite loud, that the report and the data shows that we need to be more proactive in offering part time and flexible roles. It's reactive at times rather than proactive. So the case for change, thinking about how we can use flexible working um, as a retention model. A lot of the research um, cites the fact that people leave because they apply for flexible working and it's denied on multiple occasions. Thinking, as I said already, about how we attract new teachers, but also we think about the returners. In corporate US culture, there's some interesting schemes around returnship and how they re-engage those people who have taken secondments or sabbaticals and kind of like big, big career breaks. And they're qualified to be in that profession um, and how we can re-engage them. So if we think about the very high numbers, 250,000 qualified teachers in the country who are not currently working in our schools, how can we hook them back in? Would a flexible working arrangement entice them to come back and do a couple of days? If we're really struggling to find particular subjects, math, science, could somebody do a job share between another profession and teaching? It's just something to consider about how we can flex our mindset about how we do our talent management. And then thinking about progression and how we can create visible career pathways, how we can address the pay gap discrepancies between um, the genders as well, and how flexible working will enable more women to progress to senior leadership progress to um, headship and really change the kind of the face and the feel 
of organisations and leadership. There are obviously barriers and there's things we need to consider, like going into a flexible working agreement and commitment. And um, there are things we need to dismantle and do differently. So the logistics of timetabling is one of the big ones. Um, one of the one of the main obstacles we need to overcome, considering staff student ratios, things like availability for cover, availability for duties, the working pattern arrangements of part time workers and job shares about who's in the building on what days. I know it was something that we talked about very transparently um, at my school. We enabled a lot of flexible workers, but they couldn't all have Fridays off, for example, because we, we were then left short for the number of staff in the building. So it's about being really transparent and having those conversations that you can enable flexible working, but the requester won't always get the day off they want, for example. And we had to um, take it in turns um, allocating first choice preferences, for example, to the middle leadership who were working 0.6 or 0.8. The um, impact on the budget budget means that flexible working can be more expensive in the long run. So the cost of recruiting and training and, and, and replacing staff can be offset. But it's certainly just to consider really the financial implications. The workload and the intensity of the school day. So there's a lot of literature out there, a lot of people blogging and tweeting and writing books. Think about Kat Howard's book here, let's stop talking about well-being, where she's got a lot of case studies in there about the fact that people feel like they work full time and they're paid part time. And that's something to consider. If you are on a on a reduced contract, then your commitment should reflect that. And everyone's always going to be expected in education to do some hours out of hours. We, we all get that. But if you've got someone who's on a part time contract, but they're pretty much working full time and expected to be on email every day, then that is going to be problematic. So considering how we enable flexible working and to create those conditions for what and well-being reform around it, I think is really, really key. And one of the big ones is kind of like workplace culture um, and workplace attitudes and how we need to actually change our mindsets and our approaches and our belief systems around what it means to work flexibly. And to also consider the kind of the, the justification and the motivation for it, because I do think there's sort of like massive um, generalisations that are made about it. Um, and we need to really like put trust back into the system and autonomy. And if we have more trust and autonomy, then some of the fears that people aren't pulling their weight when they're working at home, when not in the building, we can't see what they're doing would perhaps be dissipated. There's things to debunk, some parental perceptions, some children perceptions. I hear quite a lot, um, sort of like citations of children find part-time working really disabling. Parents don't like having job share arrangements. I think that really needs addressing. And I think there's some generalisations that are really, really unhelpful. And actually, um, a lot of our parents and carers work in professions where flexible working is part of their working practices. So they, they, they will be very accepting of it. Children are so adaptable. I think we, we leverage that argument unfairly and we do a disservice to the children who are quite capable of knowing two people's names. So I think there's just the things to consider here where we are placing barriers on a situation and we're prohibiting it by our mindset, which needs to be shifted. So some of the recommendations from this report from TimeWise um, and Now Teach about how we can enable and how we can um, sort of consciously design, redesign our schools to enable this to happen. Considering how we do duties, considering how, what time we start and finish school, um, considering sort of like splitting tasks into teaching tasks and non-teaching tasks or sort of teaching tasks and pastoral tasks, considering how the curriculum can be carved up. So I know I've worked in schools whereby the timetabler will give the English timetable per se to the head of English and that team will sit down and they will work out their flexible working arrangements as a team. A much more democratic way of doing it, perhaps. Thinking about how we chunk work activity, chunk, um, chunk sorry, time commitments and chunk um, how much time we spend in the building versus how much time we spend doing our jobs. I think is a way to enable flexible working to become, become more common practice. So moving from recruitment um, to retention, I have definitely seen flexibility, flexible working being used as um, a way to keep people as opposed to a way to get people. But one of the big things that I've heard from the women community in the last five years are a lot of women who are told that, yes, you can go part time, However, you cannot have your TLR if you go part time. You've got to relinquish your responsibility or yes, you can go part time, but we're going to then split your TLR based on the days you do. 
And I think we all know in reality, if you're the head of maths, you're working 0.8, you are still doing a lot of admin for your management role um, out of hours. You are still in contact with your team on that day. You're not in the building. I think we need, we need to be fair here. We need to we need to kind of like split those management and those leadership roles into whole leadership um, pieces, but then part time reduced contact teaching pieces. And I think we cause a lot of disenfranchisement and we really disempower um, and get a lot of people offside by just not being very fair and by being a, li a little bit too literal, perhaps, about um, how much time people spend doing their jobs. So I do think we really need to consider this and how we can consider enabling people to to work on those contracts that suit them, suit their lifestyles, suit their families, but trust them to do some of that role at home out of hours. So um, there's obviously been a lot of rhetoric over the last few years, particularly since Women Ed was conceived, about women in leadership and acceleration and progress. And Mandy Coulter, who was the, I think her job title was Director of People at United Learning, wrote a brilliant book um, in 2018 um, called Talent Architects. And she has quite a big section in that book about flexible working and how it needs to be part of the talent management strategy for a school and for an organisation. And she's reviewed those strata of salary differences across an organisation. It just speaks for itself, the fact that you have more women working lower down the hierarchy, being paid less, doing more part-time roles. And I think we need to flip that on its head and consider how we can enable women to progress in a profession like teaching by using part-time working, but not allowing that to then diminish um, their opportunity to progress and be a leader within the hierarchy. With the current situation, with how people are feeling about teaching, I'm very fearful, very worried that people are going to find it really hard going back into the school environment as and when schools fully reopen. I'm kind of anticipating we could have a, a mass exodus and we could have a lot of people just thinking, I just can't do it. I've quite like being at home. I've quite like working flexibly and remotely. And if schools aren't prepared to make those changes, I feel like we could lose people. But on the flip of that, all of these qualified teachers who have left working in schools for a number of different reasons could possibly be part of that solution. We could entice people who are qualified and experienced back into the profession if we used flexible working as a recruitment tool as well as a retention tool. So I think it's something to consider. I know I'm seeing a lot of people talking about, particularly those who work freelance, work independently, who perhaps haven't made the money they used to make in the, in the last few months. They are considering their career options, but are they all willing to come back full time? So I think we've got a, a kind of a, a talent pool waiting to be tapped into if we think about how to work with them, speak to them, um, enable the lifestyles that they want in order to come work in schools. So when we're thinking about the kind of some of the blockers around flexible working, I think there's different perspectives we need to consider. There's different voices of all those um, stakeholders. So like how often do we actually ask the children what they think about it? Because like, like as I said earlier on, like we do have people citing the kind of the anxiety it creates in children. But is that actually speculative or is it um, research driven? How do teachers feel about working flexibly? How do the full time teachers feel about it? How can we enable um, each other and support one another and have a more flexible approach to all aspects of the organisation. The non-teaching staff um, do tend to work more flexibly. So how can we um, sort of learn from the best practice there about what works in the organisation, in the operations roles? I've mentioned leadership already, how leaders can be visible role models for flexible working, but also how they can enable it. I do think the timetable, um, and I'm sorry to all the timetablers listening, if you are not this person, quite often the barrier to flexible working comes in the mindset and the tra traditionality and the way we do it here um, of the timetabler. There's a brilliant organisation called Edval, who have a software system that enables flexible working. When I was a head teacher and still um, very much active in Women Ed, they came and they ran a free conference for us. And we had 120 women come to my school on Saturday and the team walked them through and talked them through the kind of the principles of timetabling, which gave all of those individuals there who were perhaps aspiring timetablers or who hadn't considered timetabling as a career pathway, it gave them the kind of the leverage and the language and the questions to go back to the timetable with. So one of the recommendations was, if you want to help change the face of flexible working in your school, befriend 
the um, timetabler. Go and shadow them. Go and learn how they do timetabling. Go and help them think about it and help find those solutions so that you are actually sort of part of the process of doing the timetable rather than the timetable being done and shared and there aren't opportunities for flexible working. And then I've mentioned the governors as well. Like, so I, I think tapping into the wider um, work experience and professional experience of our governing body brings really interesting insights into um, what flexible working practices could and should look like in the school system. And then finally, the parents and the carers, like having a, a parent voice about this. Like I would rather have two brilliant teachers sharing a class than somebody who is perhaps weaker. And I think sometimes we do a disservice about the fact that but people can make this work. If you think about parent care relationships with staff, it gives them two faces, two perspectives, two personalities. And also the children get that as well. So I do think there's there's things that we could see as a massive strength and a positive around flexible working that we that we instead see as a problem. We need to reframe that and think about the kind of the solutions as opposed to the issues. Some of the research I've read, um, particularly from Lean In, who do a woman in the workplace report every year with McKinsey. And again, it is American, but they canvass the whole of the states and all of the massive organisations. And they do this data kind of like processing and they bring out the kind of the key messages about how to diversify the workforce each year. And one of the big um, learning pieces from the 2018 report was how we can work with our managers, because quite often the person who decides whether a flexible working um, arrangement application can be made doable is the direct line manager of the individual putting it in that it might go up the tree and go to the to the leadership team to the head teacher to the governors to decide but they will canvas the opinion of the person who line manages them so if we can do an awareness piece a raising awareness piece an influence piece a training piece with middle management perhaps or early senior management about the positives, the benefits of flexible working, they might then enable that to happen and see see the positives rather than the negatives. And then we can begin to see that cultural change being led by the management tiers um, in our school. So cultural ethos um, is a big one. And just some of the things I think we need to address in our schools, the concept of visibility and presenteeism. I know I've definitely worked in schools where those who are perceived to be the most present are those that who then get promoted. And I think it's really unfair for us not to take into consideration all the hours people do at home. So I know I've worked with really hardworking women, predominantly mothers, um, middle leaders, for example, who might leave school every day at four o'clock to go and pick the kids up and, and do their evening routine. But I know for a fact that when the kids go to bed, they're then logging in and doing four or five hours at night at home. I don't think that works always seen. And I think we need to challenge the expectation that if we can't see it, you're not doing it. That if the impact's not in the working day, then you're not having impact. Because I think we, we all know a lot of people who work really hard out of hours. So I think we need to proactively challenge this kind of presenteeism, that those who are at the gate first and the car park last, it doesn't mean that because they're spending a higher quantity of time in school, that the quality of their work is better. Um, and I think we really need to address that. I've mentioned um, sort of like flip meetings already, but do you mean one of the real prohibitors, I think, to, to people progressing to senior leadership is the fact that they can't commit to those those long meetings. And I think when we approach meetings in a different way, when we flip them, when we're um, sharing everything um, ahead of time, the meetings can be shorter. If we can timetable senior leadership meetings during the day, um, if we can use technology to create remote access, um, I think we can then provide some of those solutions as opposed to um, see some of these things as barriers. And I've mentioned remote working already. Here's the kind of the commitment from the DfE around how flexible working policies can not only recruit and retain staff, but it can also, also really motivate staff. You get, uh, not a lot more loyalty, but you get loyalty from staff who are able to work flexibly because that commitment, that trust is there and, you, and, and, and it's paid back in dividends. So I think it's considering the positive impacts of enabling flexible working, which really needs to be um, higher profile. This graphic comes from Flexi Teacher Talent. Um, Lucy and Lindsay are doing an amazing job, really sort of like raising the narrative and working with organisations to enable flexible working and to sort of like diversify the landscape of flexible working in schools. 
So there's some interesting data here from them about the diversity of part-time workers at teachers versus head teachers, considering the age of the children of flexible workers and considering the impact on recruitment and cover. I really recommend you follow them on Twitter, go on their website. They do um, consultancy services for schools. So I've mentioned that we know there's lots of barriers and I'm, I'm like, yes, I'm a blue sky thinker and I'm here to think about the kind of the future of flexible working. However, we obviously need to be aware of the barriers so that we can then navigate the obstacles. So considering which jobs in the school organisational structure are going to enable flexible working the best, there's going to be some jobs that are going to be hard to do. Then it's thinking about how we can um, redefine the structure and the kind of the organisational um, layout and remits of different roles and responsibilities. Can we carve up jobs across people rather than expecting one person to do it all? I think that's quite a loud statistic there that 37% of people perceive that flexible working isn't an option. Do you mean, I think sometimes I, I hear messages such as, well, no one's asked flexible working. Well, are they not asking? Because I think the answer is going to be no. Is there a, a cultural kind of assumption being made that this is not an organisation that enables flexible working? Is it something that we can do in a transparent and open way? So, for example, I used to write to all the staff in, um, in January every year, early January, and say, please, can you submit your flexible working arrangements? Because then when I was doing our staffing model and recruitment would start in January and normally fit, be finished by Easter, I knew exactly who I was looking for. I think the more transparent and open we can be about our personal situations and about our needs, the more strategic we can be about our workforce deployment. Going back to that management piece, one in 10 say that management doesn't like it. So I think there's a, that piece we need to do with the different tiers, the, the structural barriers to flexible working in our schools is, is really key. So the impact um, of flexible working does have some um, negative connotations. Again, there's things here to think about that you might have organisations who are enabling it, but how do those flexible working, workers then feel? 27% feel discriminated again, and that's something to consider that if we're letting people work flexibly, what are we then doing to make them feel fully included? That sense of belonging identity is really, really key. 42% say that their colleagues don't like it. So I think having like really fierce conversations and open dialogue is really, really key to debunk and demystify some of those myths. 49% say that flexible working has held them back in their careers. So again, something to consider here that are we enabling it, but then it's stalling professional and personal growth. 54% feel that like they're missing out on career progression opportunities. And there's something to consider here about how we manage kit days, how we manage communications when somebody's on a sabbatical or secondment or mat or um, paternity leave and contracting in advance when someone's going to be off for a prolonged amount of time about if an opportunity came up, could we let that person know? So they, they know they're part of the talent management strategy. I know that I've interviewed people who are uh, pregnant and on maternity leave. And again, some of the anecdotal testimonials from the women community are staggering. Some of the questions people are asked and some of the some of the assumptions being made about people. I think it's something we really need to consider about getting the right person in the job and then and, and then removing the barriers around um, that happening. So re-governance, as I've said already, how can we embrace flexibility in our governance models? There's a, a big spotlight about diversifying our governance talent pool, getting people from different backgrounds, different ages, different professions to lean in. Also, it's a brilliant opportunity for professional growth. I think it's one of the best CPD things you can do as an aspiring leader or an aspiring head teacher is go and be a governor in another school. So how can we embrace sort of flip governance meetings and flexible governance in order to enable a more diverse context of people to step forward if we can then enable more flexible people to lean in just having more people who understand flexible working at a governance level will then hopefully drip feed down through the whole organisation and will help that cultural and ethos change. So in summary, when it comes to flexible working, we have been through a massive disruption. We have been through a massive shift. And I think we really need to consider what can we learn from the last few months? How have our perspectives changed? How did we change our policies on the sports and our practices on the sports? And what can we learn from this opportunity and how can we carry some of that learning forward? How can we hold on to some of those um, sort of immediate disruptions and adjustments we made? How could that be a change in policy, a change in practice for the future? I think also just in anticipation for the fact that it was very reactive in response at this time. We did have to do it at very short notice. 
there's an anticipation that there is going to be another spike, potentially another lockdown in the future. How can we be ready for it? Those schools who had flexible working arrangements in place have probably, I think, found the adjustments to the new way of working a bit easier. They were a more agile team. So how can we anticipate for things like this to happen again in the future? And how can we be ready for it? How can we have the technology in place, the practices in place? So I mentioned key organisations to have on your radar. Lindsay and Lucy at Flexible Teacher Talent and their website. Um, Emma Shepherd and her team at Maternity CPD supporting parents who are on mat leave and um, paternity leave. I mentioned Now Teach, which is about career changes, like the kind of the big version of Teach First. Return to Teach and Holly's organisation is enabling those returners to come back into the profession. Another Teach First um, spin-off is the Shared Headship Network and thinking about how we can share best practice around co-leadership models. And then obviously there's then Women Ed as well and a burgeoning community of women in education at every level. I am hosting an event this Friday. So if you'd like to hear more from people who are either flexibly working or who are enabling flexible working, we've got 16 speakers this Friday at a free event for the National Teacher Learning Day. We're doing it in partnership with those four organisations there. Please come and join us. We will be live streaming it um, on Twitter. We'll also be recording it and putting it on YouTube. So perhaps use it for a CPD for your governors or your leadership in the future. And here are all the lovely speakers speakers who are going to be sharing their stories on Friday from diverse backgrounds, different sectors, different reasons and motivations for why they are flexibly working, including one of the only co-CEO models um, in the country. It's been great to hear from um, Eddie and Antonia about how they are modelling that system leadership at a flexible approach. If you want to provide some safety opportunities for your staff or read more about this, there are four books I'm aware of that really speak to flexible working. Michelle Sandberg's Lean In talks about sort of professional workplace culture. And there's some really interesting data in there. Our book from Women Ed, and there's a chapter there by Helena Marsh. Emma Turner's book about her um, flexible leadership journey. She's been a co-head in two different schools. And Mandy Coulter's piece around talent management. So four very contrasting perspectives, which are four of the books I've read as part of my research for my MA. And then rethought leadership. I've just compiled here some of the blogs and some of the articles I've written. I've been sort of looking at this now for a couple of years, thinking about it from a head teacher as a recruiter, thinking about it for, as a woman and the kind of the community of people who I work with and coach and empower, thinking about the kind of the impact on the system. And Jill Berry then wrote a really brilliant piece about it as well. So just some wider thinking pieces here for you to process. And there's lots of buzzwords when it comes to flexible working. I've just done a glossary of terms here, words to consider. There's a, a massive focus on allyship at the moment. And when we talk about so supporting women, we often talk about he for she allies. But with the diversity and inclusion, gender being very high profile and prominent, I think this is one part of that, that we are inclusive allies and we are enabling everyone in our organisations to thrive and flourish. So... Back to you, Arv, and I'm looking forward to answering questions. Welcome back. So much in that. There's everything from the uh, legislative uh, functions as well as uh, all the research that Hannah's done, all condensed into a 45-minute recorded session for you, for, for you to take away and use at Will. And as, as uh, Hannah said, that she's doing a session on Friday, but also uh, I think sessions like this are really good if your organisation isn't au fait or aware that this is something that they could be actively looking at, is to share with them so that they can actually continue this discussion within your organisation. On Twitter today, don't forget at Chilton TSA, do follow us, do join in the conversation there. There's been lots tweeted there, um, a lot res resonating with people. And I think just by the nature of them, the level of questions that we've had today, I think there's a uh, one, uh, an apathy, perhaps, in terms of it's not something that we can discuss within our schools because the structures and the frameworks don't allow it. But um, I'm, I'm really happy that we have Hannah here with us today. Um, Hannah, if you'd like to turn your camera on to actually just give us a little bit more insight into some of the issues and how we can approach flexible working. So welcome, Hannah. Hi, to the oh, stage. thanks for having me. And I'm sorry my 30 minutes is more like 49 minutes. <laughs> I did laugh right at the beginning when you said, I'm going to put together a 30 minute. <laughs> Making it time management, clearly. <laughs> One of the things that interests me about this is that when we think um, flexible working, we immediately think of a woman with a child. Um, and I think it's how we can make sure that we are inclusive in how we actually 
approach that's for working and perceiving and even listening back to myself I slipped into some of those traps when I was talking about it as well yeah and I'm um, doing this event on Friday I was very conscious that I wanted a diverse lineup and I had to tweet out several times to find male teachers and leaders who work part-time and work flexibly and I knew of three and I ended up finding five and two mm. of them were available and I'm sure there's a lot more men in the country who are working in schools in a flexible way but I think it's really important that we, we capture those testimonials and capture those case studies so that we have more diverse visible role models mm. and another thing like some of my middle leaders um they wanted to work part-time because they have another business or they wanted to work part-time because they were doing a PhD or they wanted to work part-time because they were artists and they wanted studio time so I think it's how we can open open out I guess um, our thinking about it. it flexible working is ultimately a lifestyle choice um, and the other thing that came up was around the well-being and, and Kat's book is brilliant around that because she's a flexible worker herself and we have got a workload reform issue in the country we've got a well-being culture piece to, to examine and it worries me when we hear that people are going part-time because the job's not doable full-time there, there are bigger things to address not organization if people cannot do their job full-time and they have to go part-time be paid less but feel like they're working full-time so i think we've got to be really careful about the purpose and the motivation and the intention of flexible working as well I mean, th there's lots of points that I've picked up on uh, online and and just from my conversations that I've had uh, leading up to this session. And it links in with a few of the questions. So, I mean, Julia's asked, um, what would be the starting point when an organisation perhaps they don't feel that it's appropriate within their setting? And when we add to that the fact that we've got Sharifa Lee on Twitter, she and she's also just posted on there as well, in terms of there's a lot of uh, golden nuggets that have come out of the lockdown in terms of one that we can work in different ways at very short notice and make it work so how do we one how do we start that conversation and secondly how do we ensure that the good things that have come out of this situation that we carry forward Start with making sure that our commitment to flexible working is not tokenistic if we think about flexible working within the umbrella of diversifying and being more inclusive in, in our system like we've had lots of conversations already about um diversity and flexibility is one of those diversities and I think we've got to be careful that people don't just jump on a bandwagon because they think they should do it. Mm. There needs to be a, a cultural intention and an organisational commitment to it. Um, and I, I think that's a concern. So like when I, I, I speak at a lot of events about recruitment and talent management around diversifying your workforce. And when I talk about, I mentioned flexible working in all my job specs and personal descriptions mm. and adverts, thereby I had 150 people applying for one job. People's eyes go to ching. Mm. And then they add flexible working, but they don't really want flexible work because they just want more, more people applying for the job. And that makes me sound really cynical, mm. but I think it, it needs to be a meaningful commitment. And a, a bit like diversifying your workforce and getting more BAME um, teachers into your school, does your culture actually sort yeah. of like have the supporting structures there for a diverse workforce? Similarly with flexible workers, like you can't just get a lot of part-time workers and carry on doing things the same way. So it has to be a strategic intent and yes. it has to be a planned intent and you need to be working in conjunction with HR and Mandy's now an independent HR consultant and she's doing some really interesting pieces of work strategically with big maps about how to do this. Emma Shepherd from Maternity mm. CPD and I both used to work together at the same map and she's doing a really interesting map wide piece around um, kit days and, and um, so like looking after people on uh, maternity leave, paternity leave and they talk about maternity and paternity leave not just maternity leave so there are, there are some um, demystifiers and debunking things we need to do. And the second question what from Sharifa was about definitions. Absolutely. So Doreen, I think with anything, a bit like our conversation um, yesterday about diversity and the fact that um, schools and organisations need to sit out their stool and they need to have that intent before they go to implementation. It's the same with flexible working. Look at your policy. Look at, like, look at what the messaging to staff. And then be brave and have staff voice and have parent voice because I think there's there's a there's a societal debunking to be done there around actually we like to make assumptions about what we think people need and we and we make assumptions at every part of the kind of the hierarchy of a school about why things do and don't happen and I think mm. having a really open yeah. transparent conversation um, about talent management as a whole. I think it was Marion making comments about the fact that like 
we don't always want to hear it. Mm. We don't always like hearing the truth. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you might have an SLT or governing body who think they're really inclusive and they really promote diversity and they really embrace flexibility, but the reality on the shop floor for the people doing the job is very different. So mm. I think I think it's about that transparency and that openness and that kind of working on the culture first and then working on the strategy and then the working on the practice. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a conversation yesterday and it was, uh, it was to do with the diversity side of things, but in terms of um, you, you can bring in the people that you feel that you, that you think you want to bring in, whether it's uh, through ethnicity, whether it's through flexible working, whether it's through your practices, but the, the culture has to exist that you'll bring them into, otherwise they will not thrive. And uh, just putting in two, two things together. So, I mean, obviously, just from a legislation point of view, um, it's a legal, it's, uh, you have the legal right as an employee to request flexible working so from that perspective you do have a legal right to ask for it having said that does the structure that you're and the organization you belong to make it easy for them to have flexible working because at the moment still exists and you can correct me if i'm wrong on this that if they can justify why flexible working doesn't work in their organization they do not have to approve your request but if the structure that you work in is set up against working flexibly mm -hmm. you're never going to win that argument uh, and that appeal process um, the really good so, point of, so my understanding is you can apply three times for flexible working so quite often it's denied at the first stage and your yes. policy and the and the legal documents will then outline i can't remember what the time gap is but there's a, a certain amount of weeks yeah. before you can then reapply um, and then you can reapply and then you can reapply again. And on the third time, it's very hard for an organisation to deny it or to decline it. Um, however, going back to my very initial statement about the business case imploded overnight. So that so I actually feel like, mm. like I, I love disruption, as you know. Like I, I feel like we've been waiting for this disruptive kind of like moment in the system for all the things I care about deeply for a very long time. And I feel like we have had a massive shift. And yeah. if the whole school system yeah. overnight can go to working remotely and can enable flipped meetings and can enable us all to suddenly do everything flexibly because it suits them, I feel like the business case is gone. So yes. I feel like actually yes. all those people, and I'm like, sorry if you're a head teacher or chair of governors because I might make myself unpopular here. If you've applied for flexible working in the past, it's been denied, surely you've got a very strong case right now to go back and say, I can now demonstrate the impact I can have from working remotely and working from home because I've got three months worth of evidence to show that I can do it. So I feel like actually we're at a tipping point um, and, I, and I, with lots of the things that systemically have been disrupted, we know there's going to be a lot of pushback if we suddenly get off inspections, we suddenly get sat, we suddenly get a full time working mindset again. I feel like we need to harness the energy in a collective kind of like agency right now around making those changes, because if we truly flex an organisation, it makes the, the culture of that organisation better for everyone. Um, and I yeah. think it's, it needs to be a commitment and a collective, a collective vision. Absolutely. Um, and just just getting into a little bit more granular. So there's a lot of stats that you shared and the difference between primary and secondary in terms of the requests that are made and, uh, and the existence of flexible working in whichever form that might be. And so as soon as you get into secondary, you have subjects, uh, specialisms. Has there been any research to do with certain subjects are less likely to um, allow flexible working so i'm thinking about core subjects for example and i just from personal uh. experience and the people that i've spoken to is that even to get a cpd request on something that's actually on your appraisal or your performance management is difficult to get time away because you're a math teacher or you're a science teacher or an english teacher you can't possibly be away from your classes so that's how, an interesting there, question there's very little research calls to have. Like the, 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 there's there's an absolute gap in research when it comes to flexible working. Mm. Hence why I've had to look at the US rather than the UK. Yeah. Hence why I've had to look at corporate rather than education. Um, and I, like I'm sure someone's gone up and say a PhD on it or I've done a, a, a master's on it. But there's there's definitely a lack of. So that's why my literature review is quite quite open. And then we've also got a lot of books being written from first hand experiences that aren't necessarily research based either. So I think that's definitely one of the lines of inquiry. I I would challenge that as an English teacher. Um, and dream, tell me if I'm wrong here. You're a math teacher, aren't you? So um, English, like my, all my English teams, all the schools I've I've led, I've had like between eight and ten women, usually late twenties, early thirties, and we usually have at least three on mat leave. Um, it's, it's like it's kind of a rotating door of a team. 
we've always always had a very diverse English team where only a few of us work full time. And I, I, I say that because I haven't got kids. Um, so actually, I think it's I think the bigger departments can hold it because you have more people. If you're the only teacher of RV in a school and there's what 35 lessons and you teach 35 lessons, that's harder. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So oh, I'll say there's also like putting out an advert for a point to looking at second subjects in schools of key as well because yeah. actually quite often a second subject teacher like we found it really hard to get science teachers um in the school i worked at but we had loads of english teachers so it's thinking about how you can be flexible with subject um delivery as well absolutely how do you see it moving forward i mean we, we're coming towards the end of the session now so if you're now you sitting in front of all the CEOs and all the head teachers and all the timetablers and the HR professionals within our industry, within our sector, what would be the, what would be the message that you'd want to leave with them regarding flexible working? Bearing in mind that we've got, like you said, 250,000 qualified teachers that are not in the profession. We've got a recruitment crisis and we've got a retention crisis as well. And that they're all uh -huh. documented, so they're, they're not points uh -huh. of discussion. So what would you say to them if they were sitting in front of you now in terms of using this as a mechanism? Um, what do they need to do? So ultimately, I think my, my umbrella message would be that let's stop talking in the language of recruitment crisis, retention crisis. We are in a talent management crisis. We need to look at it holistically and we need to look at all the people who work in our profession. And we also need to listen to those who have chosen to leave our profession. But we also need to listen to those who have chosen not to join our profession. And we need to do things differently. We can't carry on um, with the attrition rates we've got. It's absolutely ridiculous the money we spend on ITTE and the percentages that leave by year three and year five. Um, if we spent as much time, energy and money and resource um, on re-engaging and retaining the staff we do have, rather than trying to train new teachers, I think we'd have a very different workforce. And I, mean, I really do think that we need to consider um, our, our budgets in relation to having the best person in the building and having an experienced, mature teacher who can only work three days, surely is a brilliant opportunity for that class. And then you can find another an, like a role with a trainee teacher, for example. I think we need to think about how we can pair up staff. So I think we need to go back to our strategic intent when it comes to how we staff our schools. And we need to think more flexibly create more flexible cultures which will then enable more flexible working practices for all um i think you're right i mean and a lot of the messages that have been coming through that i've looked at is is that this is the time for the national discussion on this it, it, it shouldn't be um, isolated silos of people uh, with good practice and people that are, are working towards it this is a national discussion about how do we approach our, our sector yeah. from, from a talent point of view can I add one more thing? So I was involved in a brilliant event with Collective Ed last Tuesday, and it was an appreciative inquiry mm. about what the system can learn um, through the kind of the learning through lockdown. And one of the questions that just popped up there um, was about, if we're talking about flipped teaching, flipped schooling, how about flipped learning? And I think we do approach a lot of things in this country from a deficit mindset. We critique what's wrong. When we approach it from an appreciative inquiry perspective and we look at kind of the abundance, let's, let's make noise about what's working. Let's find those studies where flexible working is thriving, where schools haven't got a retention and equipment issue because they've got a flexible culture. And I'm thinking of John Thompson, an amazing head teacher, where a very high proportion of his staff work flexibly in a very high performing school. Let's share those stories and amplify what's working rather than what's not working. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're at the end of our session. We have run five minutes over, but that's we'd, we'd already discussed that. So I'm, ha I'm happy with that. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank you immensely, uh, Hannah, for the time that you put in to creating your presentation and then being with us this morning. So thank you, Hannah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Alf. Not a problem. And always a pleasure. Um, and obviously, if you've got any resources and anything that you want to share with the colleagues, uh, with our attendees directly, um, we will be sending out an email to them afterwards. So if there's anything like the presentation that you've done, the slides or anything else, and obviously on Twitter, please feel free to tag in anything that you're doing. Um, stick in our hashtag just so that uh, people know the work that you're doing around this and other things that you're involved in. So what a journey this week. Um, so yesterday, 
we had Leora Crudders. Today we had Hannah Wilson discussing flexible learning, uh, flexible working and creeping into flexible learning. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, we have a whole host um, of sessions. Um, for those of you who have noticed on Twitter, I do post the, the Zoom link um, for the session for direct access, just in case you've missed it um, on my Twitter handle. And that's uh, sent out in the morning. Um, but um, tomorrow we have Daniel Connor. We have Joe Miles looking at educational excellence. Thursday, we have Amjad Ali from Baymed, who will be looking at how do we recruit a diverse team. So kind of um, following on for and adding to uh, some of the discussions that we've had today and in previous sessions. And then on Friday, we have Joe Richardson to end the week looking at school improvement and the golden nuggets that we need to cherish um, when we're looking at the years ahead. Do follow us on our Twitter handle, which is at Chilton TSA. Do follow us there. Uh, share your comments and your thoughts. Keep the discussions alive. Your engagement is so valuable to us. And on that note, I have uh, sent out those people that had registered on Eventbrite a feedback and a, a request if you want to be part of our mailing list moving forward, because um, we have got some things that we'll be announcing about what's coming next after this series of hashtag LD EduChat, um, and there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, these sessions are recorded and made available to you on our YouTube channel, which is Chilton Teaching School Alliance. And I know that with flexible working, with us working in different ways, being available in different ways, that we need to make sure that you have access to high quality CPD in whichever platform that you can access, um, which is our aim moving forward. Uh, so this is me, Arv Kaushal, uh, another session of hashtag LD EduChat, Leadership Development in Education, signing off and seeing you soon. Thank you.